Lillian Hellman's The Little Foxes, 1939, stands as a hallmark of 20th century American drama. Set in Alabama during the year 1900, the play delves into themes of avarice, passive aggression, and female empowerment in the post-Civil War South. The work's debut took place at the National Theatre on Broadway in New York City, featuring Tallulah Bankhead as Regina, before embarking on a two-season tour across the United States. In 1941, Hellman adapted the play for the silver screen, enlisting Hollywood luminaries Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Teresa Wright in its cast. Numerous revivals of The Little Foxes have garnered accolades, including the 1981 production starring Elizabeth Taylor and the 2017 rendition where Laura Linney and Cynthia Nixon alternated in the roles of Regina and Bertie. Set in 1900 Alabama, the story revolves around three grown siblings who plot to amass a fortune by establishing a cotton mill. Ben Hubbard, Oscar Hubbard, and Regina Giddens invite wealthy Chicago investor Mr. William Marshall to their southern homes to finalize the venture. They work to charm Marshall, discussing their family's heritage and principles. Marshall finds himself drawn to the family and ultimately consents to the collaboration. As the men accompany Marshall out, Regina is left alone with her meek sister-in-law, Bertie. Bertie, the sole member of the group born into Southern aristocracy, voices her yearning to return to Lionette, her childhood family estate, once the cotton mill brings in money. In contrast, Regina longs to escape Alabama for a new life in Chicago. Bertie inquires about how Regina's husband, Horace, will navigate Chicago in his wheelchair to which Regina asserts that they will find a solution before Horace completes his treatments in Maryland. The brothers return to celebrate the successful deal, closure with Marshall. As they raise their toasts, they acknowledge that while this news is fortunate for themselves, it might not be as favorable for Regina. The brothers have corresponded with Regina's husband, Horace, about contributing his share of the down payment for the mill, but they have yet to receive a response. They assume that he's unwilling to join the investment and intend to raise the remaining funds through other means. Regina is taken aback by this revelation but realizes she must approach her negotiations with Ben and Oscar strategically. She suggests that Horace, being a savvy businessman, might be purposely holding back his contribution to negotiate a larger share of the profits. In their bargaining, Regina proposes that if she can assure Horace's commitment, Oscar will agree to reduce his own share. To seal the agreement, Regina's daughter, Alexandra, and Oscar's son, Leo, who is also Alexandra's first cousin, will be betrothed. This arrangement secures Oscar's son's future, leading him to agree. With Leo and Alexandra returning to the house, Regina informs Alexandra of her plan to journey to Baltimore the next morning to fetch her father. Alexandra requests that Addie, the black woman who works for them, accompany her, but Regina insists on going alone. Bertie, Alexandra's aunt, and Alexandra express concern that Horace might be too unwell to undertake such a trip on short notice, but Regina remains resolute. Regina and the men step aside for a private conversation, leaving Bertie and Alexandra alone. Bertie uses this opportunity to caution her niece about the plan to marry her off to Leo. Although Alexandra doesn't fully believe Bertie's warning, she heads upstairs when she hears a sharp cry from downstairs. On her way out, Bertie is slapped by her husband, Oscar. She downplays the incident, assuring Alexandra that it's just a twisted ankle. The second act takes place a few days later. Oscar arrives at Regina's house early in the morning, inquiring about his sister. Alexandra had written that she and Horace were due back the previous night, but there is no sign of their return yet. Oscar's concern is palpable as he frets over finalizing the cotton mill deal. Regina descends the stairs, followed by Leo, who has just returned from the bank where Horace is employed. Unfortunately, the bank had no knowledge of Horace's delayed return. Leo, however, discloses a crucial piece of information, Horace possesses a safe deposit box at the bank, which Leo admits to breaking into. Inside the box, Leo found an assortment of sentimental trinkets along with bonds worth $88,000. Horace only checks the box every six months, allowing the brothers ample time to replace the bonds and recover the money before Horace becomes aware. By utilizing the bonds, Oscar secures his son's future and eliminates the need for Horace's approval. Consequently, this move sidelines Regina from the equation. Just at that moment, 
Horace and Alexandra enter, their arrival was delayed due to Horace's fragile health. Alexandra leaves her father in Addie's care and proceeds upstairs to freshen up. While helping Mr. Horace settle in, Addie discreetly divulges the family's plan to wed Alexandra to Leo. Horace is against this notion and appalled that his wife and brothers-in-law are treating their daughter as a bargaining chip. Addie assists Horace into the parlor, where the family gathers to discuss the cotton mill endeavor. After an awkward exchange, Ben and Oscar make an exit, leaving Regina and Horace alone. In a private conversation, Horace confides in Regina about his contemplations regarding his remaining days and his financial assets. He reveals that his life expectancy is limited due to his worsening heart condition. An argument ensues, exposing underlying marital issues. Regina beckons her brothers back into the room to settle the cotton mill business once and for all. Ben and Oscar boast about duping their workers out of fair wages as part of their strategy to persuade Marshall to construct the cotton mill in the southern region. In a surprising twist, Horace declares that he will not invest in their venture. He remains tight-lipped about his decision, but during a further discussion with Regina upstairs, he discloses his reasons. He expresses his disapproval of the siblings' avarice and is unwilling to contribute to making life any more difficult for the workers than it already is. Regina is incensed by her husband's stance, prompting the brothers to rethink their approach. They decide it's prudent to take the bonds and fabricate a story that they were actually on loan to Leo, effectively making him a third partner. Act 3 commences with Alexandra and Bertie playing the piano together for Horace, while Addie serves them cake and elderberry wine. Bertie reflects on her initial encounter with the family and reminisces about the kindness Horace has consistently shown her. She gradually consumes wine throughout the scene and nostalgically discusses her childhood home at Lionette, expressing a desire for all of them to return there. Bertie harbors fears that Oscar married her solely due to her southern aristocratic background, not out of genuine love. Addie attempts to soothe Bertie's distress, cautioning her about the onset of one of her customary headaches, but Bertie begins to weep, admitting that she never truly gets them. She often turns to excessive drinking, and her husband readily employs her supposed headaches as excuses to keep her isolated. Witnessing Bertie's emotional state, Alexandra volunteers to accompany her home, leaving Horace and Addie alone. Addie is taken aback by the revelations Bertie shared in front of the 17-year-old Alexandra, while Horace is grateful that his daughter got a glimpse of what might lie ahead if she isn't vigilant. Horace confides in Addie about his wishes for the future, expressing a desire to ensure that Alexandra doesn't get coerced into a marriage with Leo after his passing. He reveals an envelope of cash with Addie's name on it and implores her to promise that she will rescue Alexandra from the life the family has planned for her. The two share a moment of solidarity, only to be interrupted by Cal, one of the household employees. Regina reappears and reminds Horace that he should avoid this part of the house, in accordance with their agreement from the previous night. Horace acknowledges that he won't repeat the intrusion and has something important to communicate before departing. He informs Regina that they've actually invested in the cotton mill. Horace discovered the truth about the bonds when the safe box was delivered to the house three days prior. He explains his intention to support their fabricated story, claiming that the bonds were a loan from Regina. He's in the process of revising his will, ensuring that the brothers repay her the $88,000, while the rest of his inheritance will be designated for Alexandra. Horace pledges to keep the actual events a secret for as long as he lives. Regina shockingly reveals that she has resented Horace for not being ambitious enough to secure their prosperity. This revelation strikes Horace deeply, as he married Regina out of love. Amid their heated argument, Horace experiences a heart attack and implores Regina to retrieve his medication. Regina callously disregards his plea, leaving him in agony. Despite his frailty and wheelchair confinement, Horace summons his limited strength to make his way to the staircase, where his medicine awaits upstairs. Collapsing on the stairs, he's unable to continue. Regina waits until she's convinced that he's beyond help before finally calling for assistance. Horace succumbs before he can amend the will. Regina, excluded from her father's inheritance, seizes power and uses blackmail to extract more money from her brothers. Reluctantly, they comply with her demands and leave the house in frustration. Alexandra and Regina are the only ones remaining. 
Regina outlines her grand plans for a luxurious life in Chicago, but Alexandra, recognizing her mother's self-centeredness, refuses to accompany her. Alexandra departs, leaving Regina alone on the staircase, wealthier, but utterly isolated. I hope you enjoyed this video, leave a like if you did, and be sure to subscribe thank you.